hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the panel on good news and diversity in open source for 2012 and 2013. Woohoo! Yay, good news! <laughs> Uh, so I'm Valerie Aurora. I'm the executive director of the Ada Initiative. We're a nonprofit dedicated to supporting women in open technology and culture, which includes open source. I'm also a Linux kernel developer, and I do occasional consulting work still. Uh, working to improve diversity in open source can be discouraging and depressing when we focus only on the bad news, and there's plenty of bad news. One of the Ada Initiative's jobs is to encourage people like you to keep working towards that goal. We organized this panel to show people how much progress we've all made towards opening up open source software for everyone in 2012 and 2013. And as Sumana points out, 45 minutes is not enough time. <laughs> you will see me having to control people. Okay, so I will introduce each of our panelists and then each of them will tell two stories about how diversity in open source improved over the last year or two, taking turns in between stories. Please save your questions for the end of the panel if there's any time at all. <laughs> Let's get started. Okay. Ashish Laroya is a developer in Debian, a former software engineer at Creative Commons and the Participatory, Participatory Culture Foundation, and lives in San Francisco. Today, he is the executive director of Open Hatch, a nonprofit that improves newcom newcomer friendliness and gender diversity within open source communities and programming user groups. Ash Dryden, wow, are you guys even in the order? This is great. It's wonderful working with open source people. <laughs> Ash Dryden is a Ruby developer and conference organizer. For the past year, she has been traveling the country educating people about the lack of diversity in tech and about how to solve the problem. She's also writing a book called The Diverse Team, which provides businesses with the tools to increase diversity within their organizations. Lucas Black uh, has a day job. Her day job is release management for Firefox products at Mozilla. Woohoo! She's on the advisory board for the Ada Initiative, has created a growing program arranging partnerships between Mozilla and various diversity initiatives that promote learning and removing barriers for people who are interested in coding and working with open web technologies. She's always looking for more ways to engage with people who are interested in open tech, but just need a little bit of help finding their way in. Sumana Hariharisuara is the engineering community manager for the Wikimedia Foundation, the nonprofit that supports Wikipedia. She got into open source via Miro and Gnome, what is Miro? Uh, and is especially interested in fostering participation in open culture among women and people of Indian descent. She lives in New York City. Liz Henry, our final contestant, is the bug master, <laughs> is the bug master for Mozilla and is on the automation tools team. She was formerly a developer and producer for Blogger, B-L-O-G-H-E-R. She helped organize some, yeah, there's, it's different from the other one. <laughs> she helped organize some bar camps and Wiki Wednesdays while working for social techs and dabbles in Python, Perl, and PHP. Her books include Unruly Islands and the Wiscon Chronicles, Carnival of Feminist Science Fiction. She lives with her partner and their children in San Francisco. So hopefully we're at least starting out with a good uh, example of diversity in open source. <laughs> All right, uh, Ashish, would you like to get started? Uh, hi, so I will just quickly uh, share my first story, which is a story about the Free Software Foundation's Libre Planet Conference. Were any of you there by any chance this year? Cool. Uh, yay, of course. Uh, so I missed it this year, sadly. But the brief news I wanted to share is that of the, of the dozen plus presentations that took place at Libre Planet, 40% of them had at least one woman speaker. Some of them were panels. And of the speaker pool as a whole, 30% of them were women. Gender diversity is just one aspect of diversity in free software, I suppose, but it's the easiest one. It seems to be a really important one to work on and sort of the easiest one to use as a lens to the rest of them. So I'm super impressed by FSF. So in the Ruby and Rails community, we have uh, an organization called Railsbridge. Eat it. Whoa, sorry guys. I just want to apologize for that. Uh, all right, so uh, in the Ruby and Rails community, we have a program called RailsBridge, which aims to uh, get more women into uh, Ruby and Rails and to get more women contributing to open source. Uh, this past year, uh, we hit uh, 100 different RailsBridge events, which take place all over the world. Uh, all of the curriculum is open source, which allows anybody to kind of pick up and take it and run with it. Uh, and this year more than any, or like this past year more than any, I've seen uh, uh, more women who have attended uh, as students actually go and start their own. 
Hello. Um, okay, so the, for the first one, I guess uh, it's been over the past. You said it's okay to talk about like previous years too, maybe. And um, uh, so at Mozilla, um, Mitchell Baker is is the chair of the Mozilla Foundation, and she has her own discretionary uh, funds, I suppose. And I asked her for some of them, and I get to do pretty much whatever I want with the, that money as long as I'm connecting um, diverse groups with open source. So it sort of uh, has just worked out really well that um, whenever people need small amounts of money to put on things like, well, I mean, it's not small, but you know, AdaCamp uh, or uh, one-off coding events or, um, or or hack nights or things like that, pretty much anything. I mean, uh, then I can help leverage Mozilla's buy-in on that, uh, and I can do that up to a certain amount without even having to ask permission. So that, over the past year or so, has been really amazing because uh, the first year that I got permission to use this money for the things I cared about, I couldn't even find enough places to put it. And this past year, um, I think I'm definitely going to max out that budget, and I'm going to try to ask for more for next year. So that's the good news. Come see me if you want to do something. I'm going to stand to make it easier for people in the back to see me. Um, so in the last few years, um, the outreach program for women paid internships uh, to help anyone who identifies as a woman um, uh, participate in open source and get their first steps, including in coding, design, documentation, marketing, testing, and so on, have really taken off. These are administered by the GNOME Foundation, but in the last couple years, more and more open source projects are participating under that umbrella. And it's really helped as a supplementary feeder uh, to get more women into open source in general. And it has accomplished its original primary goal as well of getting more women aware of and applying for and accepted into the Google Summer of Code internships as well. This is the year when we have the most, uh, the, per uh, the percentage of women uh, among the thousand plus Google Summer of Code participants this summer is the highest it's ever been. And it can, looks like that trend is going to continue and, and we're working to help it continue. And I'm really glad that Wikimedia has gotten involved. In previous years, we had zero or one uh, out of you know four or six Google Summer of Code participants being women. This year, like seven out of 22 of our participants are women. And a lot of them came through just the awareness spread through Outreach Program for Women. It's a great success story. I will look up the percentage and tell it to you at the end of this talk. <laughs> Hi. Um, I wanted to um, say as an example of increasing diversity work in open source, I really enjoyed the accessibility um, work that was done at AdaCamp just last week. Um, uh, at least AdaCamp happened last week. Um, and then I was very pleased and surprised to get here to Open Source Bridge and there were like blue travel tape travel lanes which help a lot of people for access, um, not just wheelchairs. Um, a lot of those ideas I have been trying to spread through Contagion into the open source tech or tech conference world from WISCON, which is a large feminist science fiction convention that happens every year in Wisconsin. Um, they have a accessibility committee of many people who work throughout the year to keep improving accessibility for this conference of a thousand people. It happens every year in the same hotel, so they have the same venue and they've developed a huge suite of you know tools to make the space event space more um, accessible in many different axes um, to different groups of people. And as I've attended the science fiction convention over the years, I just keep seeing it get better and better. And the best part for me is I'm not on the committee. <laughs> like, so I found that mind blowing in itself. Like usually people inviting me to speak at a conference or people that I'm going to a conference and I say, hey, can I get in? in a wheelchair? Um, or can you just tell me information about the map of the event space so I can know how to get around? And they want to put it on me to do all the work. And um, that has been a pleasant change that I hope spreads through further contagion through the open source world. Um, and I would love, I'm not sure how our format's gonna go, but I would love to like cover some points of why that kind of accessibility, how it can work and why it's important. But it's beautiful to see. 
the percentage of women among GSOC participants this year is 9.5%, up from 8.3% last year, 7.1% a year before. And uh, among, um, let's, let's plan on 12% next year. Let's try. Uh, hi again. I'm still Ashish, and I <laughs> want to tell you a bit about uh, two years of Python community gender diversity outreach. So, um, so with Jessica McKellar, I co-founded the Boston Python Workshop for Women and Their Friends in early 2011. Bless you. And uh, that was an attempt to clone the success of the San Francisco Rails Bridge to uh, Boston and Python and to try to have me learn something about more successful events, which I learned something from. And uh, since then, They've spawned a whole bunch of spin-off events. They've spawned, spawned a whole bunch of new organizations like PyStar and PyLadies. And I think what's especially interesting is that in Boston in particular, some of the attendees who through this learned about the Python user group created other meetup events like Boston Open Government that often meet co-located co with the Python user group. So it's creating sort of content diversity as well as people diversity. And uh, this year, the Python Software Foundation is sponsoring Open Hatch to run a meta mentorship thing where we help Python user groups run a greater number of gender diversity events, newcomer friendliness events, and uh, bring more gender diversity to the speaker pools of those, uh, of those user groups. And I am now bound over the next five months and the previous month to do that about 14 times across the world. Uh, so this year is our first year doing uh, Rails Girls Summer of Code. Sorry. Uh, it, our, it's our first year uh, doing Rails Girls Summer of Code, which is very similar to the Google Summer of Code project, with the exception of that we don't require uh, the women who are participating to be students. Um, over the course of two weeks, uh, through the community, we raised $85,000. And it's still, I haven't checked it in the past few days, but it continues to go up. Um, so this is a program that pays women to contribute to open source and participate in projects, pairs them with people who lead projects as well as mentors and coaches, uh, and helps increase the number of women that are contributing to open source. Because uh, the statistic right now is 1.5 to 3% of people who contribute to open source are women. So this program is working to correct that. Uh, okay, so the second thing that I guess I would talk about a little bit is actually more organizational. Um, it may not be as forward-facing because uh, if you're not a Mozillian, you won't hear about it. But if you are, and maybe you are, because there's thousands of people out there who do contribute to Mozilla, but um, we're going to be having a summit in October, uh, which will bring... Uh, three different locations, 600 people in each to really align on uh, what it means to be a Mozillian. And part of the work I'm doing right now for that is um, working on a diversity committee that will be engaging those attendees in very specific ways in which we can move forward, uh, ag acknowledging the diversity we already have and being more open to more diversity. So for me, that's a really exciting um, shift because people may or may not know that there were some times when some things at Mozilla were very tricky uh, with regards to some really strong opinions by some people and some very exclusionary um, communication styles. And uh, so I'm really happy that we are now, um, that people, that there's buy-in from higher ups in the organization to really get people uh, working on that and talking about it and um, putting some some frameworks in place that will m m make it so that those things have to change, they change for the better, and that if that turns out to not be a place where some people who can't handle diversity uh, can't handle it, then they don't have to be there. So that's where uh, we're working towards, and um, there'll be more on that in the coming months. A lot of this, uh, a lot of groups were already existing before 2012, but I think that in the last year and a half, we've seen burgeoning, if I may, that's a technical term. Um, we've seen the burgeoning of interrelated educational groups uh, that aim on interrelated things like uh, getting more women into, let's say, the Python community, uh, getting more uh, diverse people from educational uh, institutions into like basic programming knowledge and stuff like that. Uh, we have Software Carpentry, Open Hatch, Hack Bright Academy, Hacker School, Rails Girls, Black Girls Code, Write Speak Code, Girl Develop It, and they're talking. We're talking to each other. 
You know, we're not just in little silos. Uh, the Open Hatch events mailing list, for instance, is a place where people who work on all sorts of things like this end up talking with each other and uh, swapping best practices. A lot of these groups are being quite careful, for instance, Hacker School, to provide manuals online in a way that other people can easily learn from. The Hacker School manual is fun to read. There's a thing called Op School that's starting so that people can learn how to do system administration and share a curriculum. And I, I find it so great as a, a fundamental infrastructure for diversity and open source that we're, you know, there are lots of instructors being trained at things like the Open Hatch Train the Trainers earlier today and, and going forth and, and teaching people in communities and uh, across borders. I thought Hacker School was really interesting in that they have, in part of, in, as part of their structure, they have like a consciousness raising seminar. I don't even know what they call it. What do they call it? They call it something like that. What? It's like a framing, framing exercise. Yeah. Well, maybe they call it something else like diversity, but yeah. Um, um, so anyway, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about hacker spaces and um, the um, burgeoning. <laughs> no, the emergent, um, uh, the emerging feminist hacker space alliance. Um, <laughs> Feminist Hackerspace Alliance. Um, right now, I mean, a name is pretty much all. <laughs> um, and well, so um, some years ago, I started asking the question: um, um, If we were acting as feminist hackers, what would that mean? Would we be doing anything different, and would we be doing it differently? Would we have different ethics to our hackeriness? Um, and the discussions around that led to some interesting things, including a feminist hackers mailing list. Um, and um, I guess that has been one location along with Geek Feminism and the Geek Feminism Wiki and Ada Initiative of people um, being in touch with each other and then um, being inspired to start hacker spaces. I'm not sure, Lee, I'm looking at Lee because she's part of the um, <laughs> part of the new Seattle feminist hacker space, the attic. Um, and now there are efforts, I think, in Portland and in San Francisco. And there's one I just found out about last night in Montreal. So I didn't even know that was happening. So people are doing this not to split away from existing hacker spaces, but to provide, I think, a source of strength. And I think if you think of them as outreach and incubators and safe places, um, where we don't have to have that fight. So I'm just thinking of that. If I weren't having to explain feminism to people all the time in my hacker space, then what else could I be doing? So I'd like to be doing that in a hacker space. And <laughs> um, I, I hope that makes sense, but <laughs> um, I'd like to be doing that and then be able to work better with the lovely hacker spaces of which I'm also a part and will remain a part. So that's been awesome. And there is no secret feminist cabal that I'm proud to be part of. Uh, yes, uh, you all have done such a wonderful job of being both uh, concise and encouraging that we have um, tw 23 minutes left. So I'll tell very briefly these things, uh, the list that I have right here. Um, uh, you can talk amongst yourselves to decide uh, if you want to tell more stories, or maybe we can get people from the audience to come up here and uh, tell their stories as well, because I know we have a lot here. All right, so consider it amongst yourselves. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to mention something I find very exciting is uh, the formation of Homozilla, the group for uh, LGBTQ people at uh, Mozilla. I, this is something I've been looking for for a long time and thrilled to see. I don't know that much about it because I'm not part of it, but maybe one of our Mozillians can tell us more. Um, there's a related, there's a, now a code of conduct for the uh, covering the entire Mozilla community and the Python Software Foundation and the uh, Django Software Foundation are very close to adopting one as well. Um, one of the things that I liked specifically about the Code of Conduct for Mozilla is that they called out, they said, the point of this is to stop exclusionary behavior, like things that unnecessarily exclude people for things that are not relevant to what we're doing. And that was the first time I really saw that articulated in that manner. So it's like, okay, we're getting somewhere. Um, just some quick statistics. Uh, I know there's a lot of bad press about PyCon uh, this year, but it had 20% women attendees and at least 
women speakers. This is incredible. I can't even, Im I never would have, I, if you'd told me this a year ago, I wouldn't have believed it. Uh, and another quick note to show the depth of support, 85% um, of JS conf attendees donated to the ADA initiative. Um, it was a little checkbox you had to uncheck. 15% of people cared enough to uncheck it, but I mean, this is still 85% who were willing to give five bucks. This is great. So, um, thoughts? And I'll be skipped and figure it out as it happens. Uh, I, so I've been very encouraged over the past year. I've been traveling the country and speaking a lot online and, and writing blog posts about the lack of diversity in tech and what we can do to kind of uh, fix it and the, the causes of the problems and, and, and maybe uh, the kinds of behavior that we can start changing. Um, and I've been really encouraged to see the number of people that are latching on to it from all walks of life from all over the world. Um, even for as many people um, who are kind of upset about the idea that we talk about things like diversity, um, I've seen so many more people basically step out of the shadows and say, like, hey, this is, this is what we should be doing. We do want more people. Uh, we want uh, everybody to feel welcome and comfortable in our communities. Um, and I've seen that in so many different software communities. So um, thank you if you're obviously part of those people. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say about Py PyCon. I really enjoyed like Lucas and I helped put on the feminist hack have host the feminist hacker lounge, and we just had the idea that we would get a booth space and we would set it up with bead bags and make it like a cozy den living room for people to 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 just sit and hack and do whatever. And that worked out beautifully. And people came in. And we were right next to the Py ladies, and um, we were sort of in a little nexus of nonprofit women, Python, diversity organizations. It was, it was great. Yeah, yeah, and people commented so much on, oh, I feel welcome, and you're not behind a table and talking to us across the table and trying to give us a sticker. You're just saying, come on in and hang out with us, and that's the way I want like our open source projects to be, you know. I'm at the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'm really happy about some things that we've been doing in the last couple of years, specifically aimed at decreasing our gender gap and improving the ratio of, um, of contributors and, and readers and so on on our projects. Um, we ha uh, within the Wikimedia communities, uh, the technical communities, and then certain individual local physical communities and so on, we've seen a spread in the last two years of friendly space policies. Um, I really am thankful to the Geek Feminism Group and the Ada Initiative for sort of starting the language that then, you know, I customized a little bit for our technical events, and then some other people have customized it a little for their local events. Wikimania, our yearly conference, now has a friendly space policy, and we're actually going to be talking at that conference about, hey, wouldn't it be nice if there were a friendly space policy online? And that, you know, some contributor that, uh, you know, just put this submission in and it got accepted and then sort of contacted me and some other people who had been interested and said that. We've also seen uh, that there's growth in initiatives that have as a, a sort of side effect, sometimes quite intentional, um, the effect of bringing in more women contributors, like our partnerships with galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, the GLAM projects, because when you bring in like museum curators and librarians and stuff like that into Wikimedia partnerships, uh, there is a, a certain gender balance there that's different from the one that's currently on the lot of the Wikimedia projects. And uh, the initiative on the English Wikipedia, the Tea House, which is a, a welcoming space that's uh, designed with its UI meant to be a little bit more like a lounge, where where people sit and talk to each other and help each other out, um, and, and you know you introduce yourself and you feel welcome. That uh, the, the tea house has proven quite successful in helping new people get started, including a lot better proportion of women. So uh, I hope these trends continue. So uh, in early 2012, Jessica McKellar, who's an Open Hash board member, was emailing I think Sisters Dev about the. Um, these open source comes to campus workshops that we run and how we're especially interested in running them with women in CS groups. And then uh, I received an email that from my perspective was out of the blue to our public contact list that said, hey, I'm at the University of Maryland. I run our women in CS group. Wouldn't you please come here and teach, teach us how to get involved in open source? So uh, we assembled a team of volunteers in the Maryland area. We had Jessica come down and I came in. And uh, we've just been overwhelmed by women in CS groups who want to learn more about open source and to get more involved. 
Uh, this year, we, work, we ran such an event at Harvard and at Wellesley, and we're running probably about seven across, the, across 2013. Um, and it's just a great pleasure to have the chance to do that. I, I have the awesome good fortune to have a, a, a GNOME outreach program for women intern starting this summer, and she just started this week, and she's awesome. And I'm so happy to Ziana. She's helping me at Mozilla, and I am very excited about that and feel very especially excited that I'm not asking someone to come and participate for the sake of diversity without paying them. So I'm very happy about the whole paying people to do things idea. My OPW intern this year was a woman in her third trimester of pregnancy. Um, and so she got a really interesting thing to do while she was you know, stuck at home that had flexible time so she could go to doctor's appointments. Today, just today, I got an email from her that said, hey, how are things going? I might be ready to kind of come back. Uh, yeah, this is fantastic. Um, uh, I'll d talk a little bit about uh, backlash and how it's a positive sign, and then I suppose we can take questions or stories from the audience. Great. Um, yeah, so this is uh, uh, often when um, we make some sort of big progress in the cause of diversity and open source, uh, it upsets people who like it the way it is. Uh, and this results in some giant online outcry or an in-person sort of event or insult or something like that. Um, it, it's really hard to see these things and not think, ah, oh, <laughs> this is my community, no. No, this is a loud, obnoxious part of your community. <laughs> and when it's really nice to have numbers like um, the 20% women at PyCon or the 85% at JSConf who donated to the Ada Initiative, right? That tells you like, yes, the majority of the people in your community probably agree with you. Uh, and it's just hard to tell because we're nice and polite or something like that. So, um, but. Backlash is a part of social change. It shows that you're upsetting people who like things the way that they are. And so I really encourage you to, to be angered by backlash and to, to be um, provoked into action, but also to say, hey, we're making progress. So, all right. Uh, questions or stories? Um, our second year of Open Source Bridge was our lowest number, and that was around 20%, and it's been over 30% this year, and much, much more, especially with attendance. Uh, that's just for speakers, is um, about 40%, I think, this Wait, year. Speakers are 40 almost, almost. I need to do the final numbers, because I didn't put in my three numbers, my three speakers who are all women for my panel uh, tomorrow. Yeah, it was about 40%. She was one of our selection committee people, so, like, our conference is specifically trying to do this, and we've been one of the forerunners, and I've talked to a few of you about that before. Hi, a bunch of you. So um, we're, we're working on it, and I'm glad to see everyone else's, and thank you. So yeah, it would be great to see blog posts on that, and I think OS Bridge is uh, such an example uh, for the rest of the open source community. It's, yeah, it's the social justice and open source conference. It's wonderful. So, uh, do we have any other stories from the audience or questions? All right, I'll start with you and then, then Sarah's next. Hey, I'm Jesse. Um, just a question for the panel. Uh, I'm a Python programmer um, and I went to PyCon and I subscribed to all the Python blogs. And it seemed like in the last couple of years, Python specifically erupted when it came to geek feminism and diversity. And, but I'm not sure if that impression is correct because I don't subscribe to all the Ruby and JavaScript blogs. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if you guys also had that impression that Python was somewhat distinctive. And if so, why and can it be replicated? Hi. Hi. I I'm not the reason. Uh, <laughs> Wait, that came out not quite. Anyway, uh, so, um, no, that's because Jessica McKellar is probably the reason. So, uh, in all seriousness, uh, there's been a lot of, historically in Python land, it's been a, like, passively friendly community for decades. 
Um, and it was, the language was started with an education focus, just to contrast it with other, with Perl, for example, which was started with a system in focus. Um, the, the things that I think, so yes, I do think that Python is distinctive in this regard. Uh, I think that having a central organization like the Python Software Foundation has helped us as a community express that and put money where our mouths is, but almost like put the mouthpiece of Python behind all that. Um, there's uh, a lot happened uh, four or five years ago with the creation of a diversity mailing list on the python.org domain. <laughs> and uh, a, lot of, a lot of the follow-up from the discussion there concluded that just a discussion list wasn't the right strategy to cause change. And uh, so Jessica and I did this one thing in Boston, and that, I think, sparked a lot of people into thinking very concretely. And all those people have done way more than I have. I just want to very quickly note, uh, uh, I view PyCon as a distinctive, but also just a leader, a forerunner of the rest of the open source community. Uh, and specifically, they have um, many prominent leaders who are very active and outright about wanting to get more women involved. Just three of them are um, Guido Van Rossum, Jacob Kaplan Moss, and Jesse Nuller. Um, so I want to get to Sarah, but is this a quick comment? or Sarah first, or you first? Sarah first. Okay. Sorry, can you, would you mind coming up? Hi, so I'm Sarah, and uh, for the first time this year, oh, can you hear me now? Yay! So I'm Sarah, I'm a Linux kernel hacker, and for the first time this year, uh, the Linux kernel was participating in the FOSS outreach program for women, and the response we got was so awesome! Uh, we got 41 applicants applied originally for um, only like two or three positions. We ended up taking seven of them and uh, we, they ended up submitting so many patches. So for, for uh, context, it's really hard to get a patch into Linux kernel. We're really, really, really picky. Um, and so Oracle, for comparison, last uh, kernel version for like th over three months they submitted 160 patches. Over 13 days, our applicants submitted 144 patches and got them accepted. So it's fucking awesome. And thank you to everyone involved in making the Linux kernel internships for OPW a reality, which include uh, Sarah Sharp. So thanks. Uh I hope it's okay to ask two very quick questions, and maybe you can answer them at the same time. The first one is, where are we at with unicorn talks? <laughs> have, have we moved on? And the second one is, what's happening with the older women in open stuff uh, initiatives? Yes, we do need to define unicorn talk. Um, so I'm trying to remember whose law it is that if you are a woman in open stuff, you will eventually be asked to give a what it's like to be a woman in open in this thing talk. Um, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm lucky. I don't know if I've actually gotten invited to give that talk yet, but maybe it's just the Damocles sword, you know, <laughs> that like, I don't know, maybe someday like five years from now, I'll go into a completely different open stuff thing and then dun, 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 you know, it'll come to me. Um, but... I wanted to mention that uh, OPW has actually been useful for women, um, as I mentioned, uh, doing maternity in some way, uh, w and women transitioning back into the workforce after some period of being full-time stay-at-home moms. Uh, or something like that. We have a few people uh, either in the most recent round or in the current round who are doing that. Um, and so it, but I don't know if it's really specifically about like, in, it, it, OPW is not like mega focused on that, but I think it's still useful as a side effect. It's a thing you can do from home. It's flexible. It's meant for, you know, an on-ramp. So that has been helpful for, for some of those folks. Did you have something? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so, so as a woman who kind of does give the unicorn talk quite a lot, um, um, I I personally find it really important, and I've been really inspired by people like Scud who have, have given talks that could be construed as the same in the past. Um, 
just because there are a lot of people who don't necessarily understand still the diversity, uh, lack of diversity is a problem, but also that the lack of diversity in tech isn't just related to women. Um, so that's been something that's really important to me that we're like pushing all of these initiatives in a very intersectional way. So we're confronting, <laughs> so we're, con we're confronting uh, a lot of different problems and helping a lot of people that don't necessarily have the, visib the visibility or the voice yet to be asked to give a unicorn talk about those things. So I, you, you said it. I'm so glad. So I, th we had the downstairs. I noticed the the intersectional feminism stickers, and um, the person behind the sticker table asked me. People are really happy about these stickers. What 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 is intersectional feminism? And and I was like, Google it. I, I gotta go. And um, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but what tweet? Anyway, whatever. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so that's been something that I, is dear to my heart. And I, I think it, it, it maybe isn't completely an answer to your second question about where are the older women or older diversity people, older people as an axis of diversity? As in groups like Linux chicks. Oh, that's different then. Maybe. Okay, well, anyway, I want to say this thing um, about... <laughs> um, about intersectionality and what we are working for. When we say we want to increase diversity in this thing, that means that the thing will change. Like, that actually means that the thing that we're defining, its parameters and its boundaries and what it's actually about will shift because it will have different people in it who come from a different background. So intersectionality was an uh, uh, intersect, uh, was an idea from Kimberly Crenshaw uh, in the 80s, I can't remember exactly when, a uh, feminist philosopher. Um, who um, put forth like that, you know, uh, kind of the concept that there are multiple intersecting oppressions or uh, whatever language you want to use to instead of oppression, I'm fine with, but um, <laughs> ways in which people can be subordinated or um, have difficulty socially and that their intersection, their intersecting points are different. You can't just go, oh, you're a woman right now in this context and you're diverse in that way, but in this other one, you're black and you're, you, you, if you're actually more than one category at the same time, then that will function differently, right? I know you guys are reaching for the mic, but I just wanna say with that, one more thing, um, that, that the goal should, our, our, I'm hoping that our goal is not to um, bring more of us in to emulate the culture and become part of the oppression. So we have to think about that. And we've heard a lot about that this conference, which has been be happy. Yeah, I was on that tip, I think it's really exciting to see that there's more diversity within the diversity groups that are coming up. So, I mean, um, there's gonna be a trans hackathon in the Bay Area in September. Um, and also a friend of mine at uh, Girl Develop It, who also teaches at Hackbright, said that Hackbright got approached by somebody who basically wanted to pay for them to do training for women who'd been in the prison system, which is like the most exciting thing in the world yes. <laughs> for me to hear. I know, I was like, point me to them. <laughs> we will talk. Uh, but I, I think, that I take that as a really good sign that um, that not only is diversity, uh, I mean like eventually we just said that word and and, and be moving more towards uh, Keep, just keep looking for whoever you don't see around you. And it's hard sometimes not to see what's not there, but that we are people who are trying to do that. And all these groups are encouraging others to do the same. Uh, on the, uh, the, the topic of age diversity, uh, like I said, there, uh, as Scud pointed out, there aren't groups uh, about age diversity right now. Oh, wait. oh sorry. Oh. Let me restate my second question, which was um, the older groups, not the older women. So things like Linux chicks and Debian women and things like that that have been around for ages, um, where are they at now? Are they still growing? Are they fading away? Are they different? I'm interested. I'll try to be brief. Um, so I will uh, go ahead and since I pulled up the statistics and I'm interested in diversity and open source and we wrote about it and we measured it. <laughs> uh, uh, open tech and culture actually. Uh, at AdaCamp, 25% uh, of our attendees were 25 years, or, or AdaCamp DC, 25% of our attendees were 25 years old or un under and 
twenty uh, percent were forty years or older, uh, and it was a pretty great distri distribution all along that. So uh, that's one of the things I love about Ada Camp is people are so different in so many ways. Like for people who are all women and open stuff. <laughs> we look and act and come from so many different places. Um, the uh, the older uh, women in open source groups, uh, that they aren't really doing much right now, basically. Uh, Mary Gardner and I gave a talk at Linux Conf AU two years ago, uh, sorry, uh, and uh, tried to understand, like put, graph them on, on these different axes of like size and interest. And it kind of we feel like the community has sort of outgrown those very, very specific things. Although stuff like PyLadies really shows that there's still a place for these groups um, when they have, I think, a, pur a specific purpose. Um, so that's my thought. Yeah. Um, I'd like to do as quickly as I can to address a number of things. So uh, in terms of older groups, uh, for example, Debbie and Women, are somewhat recently, uh, who knows if it's the same thing, uh, ran a mentorship uh, series in 2009, I, sorry, 2010, I think. Um, somewhat active, and they in 2011 ran a, ran an online event with Open Hatch to help teach people how to build Debian packages. Um, Gnome Women, in effect, uh, I think that to see the groups is almost the wrong lens, but to look at the people and who were in those groups before and the charters that the group set forward and see if those charters being adopted. And Gnome Women, in a way, morphed into the outreach program for women.